now what I'd like to do is introduce Professor Ayelet Israeli. Ayelet is an associate professor of business administration in the marketing unit at Harvard Business School. She teaches the e-commerce course in the MBA elective curriculum, the data-driven marketing course in the Harvard Business Analytics, Analytics program, and in various executive education programs. Today, she's going to draw on her experiences teaching MBA and executive education classes and her lessons learned from her ongoing participation in the Harvard Business School's Virtual Teaching Task Force. So welcome, Ayelet. Uh, thank you so much, Sandy. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, in case you're curious, we have close to 2,000 2, participants at this point. Uh, I'm very excited to meet all of you and to uh, share what I've learned with all of you. Uh, so let me share my slides. Um, and we'll start uh, going. Uh, so um, just to give you a quick background uh, about myself, uh, like Sandy said, I'm a professor at uh, Harvard Business School. I'm actually connecting right now from my office uh, in Boston. Um, it is morning here, uh, but I wish everyone a good morning, a good afternoon, good evening, and good night. I know everyone is logging from different locations. So thank you all for uh, joining us and participating. Uh, in terms of my research, I'm actually looking at how uh, manufacturers and consumers make data-driven decision-making, especially in the context of an online channel or the internet. Uh, so while education is not necessarily a core part of my research, I became very interested in, in it now uh, due to the pandemic. Uh, so why am I actually talking to you about online teaching or online learning? Um, let me tell you a little bit about that. Uh, so just to give you a little bit of background on my knowledge uh, on the topic. Uh, so first, in the last two years, I've been teaching in um, an online uh, program that we have at Harvard. Uh, this is called the Harvard Business Analytics Program. It's a nine-month certificate program that has uh, instructors from all over Harvard, uh, including the business school. And uh, what we do in this program is most of it is uh, online. So we taught over Zoom, and we taught this in a period where uh, Zoom was something that, you know, uh, you only thought about in the context of cameras and not as a word that every single person know what it means. So it was a very different experience. But through that, we learned a lot about how do you teach online? How do you think about online teaching? How do you craft an online class, et cetera? Um, so uh, starting with that experience, uh, I then uh, what happened was that in March, uh, when the pandemic started uh, uh, growing uh, worldwide, and especially in the U.S., um, the Harvard Business School created a virtual teaching task force. Uh, this task force was headed by, uh, or is, uh, I guess, was headed by Srikant Datar, uh, and included a lot of us uh, at the school. Um, first, it included uh, faculty. Um, a lot of us that were teaching in the online uh, program that I mentioned earlier uh, were recruited for this task force because of our experience. Uh, we also had people joining us from IT, uh, instructional designers, people uh, at the business school that are in charge of uh, teaching and helping people with uh, teaching education, people that are experienced in online program. Uh, so all of us met together and tried to figure out how do you uh, revamp and change um, how the school has been doing teaching because of this pandemic and because we, we saw that we will have to move online. Uh, so what happened in this task force, one of the first ideas that uh, we kind of uh, tried to do is within a week and a half or two weeks, we actually had to onboard everyone to online teaching. Uh, so one of the members of the task force that uh, is from IT brought this concept that we all know from uh, product design and entrepreneurship of a minimum viable product. We call this a minimum viable classroom or an MVC. And the idea then was how do we create uh, an MVC experience where, you know, you still have a lot of learning, uh, but you don't have to go get all the bells and whistles just because of the time that we had. Um, what we worked on then in, in these two weeks are uh, revamping documentation, ensuring that everyone has the technology that they need uh, in order to be able to teach and to learn online, uh, ensuring that everyone knows how to use Zoom, how should they be thinking about their uh, boards and a lot of other things that I will uh, share with you shortly. Uh, of course, we also did the training, uh, the documentation and try to bring everyone on board. So 
Uh, over time, when people got used to it, they tried, uh, they started experimenting and trying to figure out how do we actually improve this online teaching experience. Um, but overall, the semester went uh, pretty well. Uh, then we uh, got to the summer. Uh, over the summer, we worked also with students and other people to try to figure out how to make um, online education better for the upcoming year, as well as hybrid education. Uh, today, I'll be focusing mostly on just the, the online remote option and, and not hybrid. Um, one of the things that we did in the virtual teaching task force that turned out to be very valuable was that uh, before um, actually every uh, professor entered uh, an actual classroom uh, or a, an actual virtual classroom, uh, we uh, recruited uh, our um, students, uh, graduates from um, our various online programs um, to help faculty train uh, basically in a practice session uh, so that they will be able to see what it's like to teach online. And it turned out to be one of the most valuable experience. Uh, so if you have the opportunity, and I will mention this again and again, because uh, I think practice is really important uh, in this context and, and really understanding, you know, what is going on, what is different, and how do I make sure that I feel comfortable and confident in this new norm and in this new uh, situation where I'm sitting in front of a computer and not in front of a classroom. Um, since, the, since, the, since March and throughout uh, the year until now, I've participated in panel discussions in conversations with colleagues at HBS and other schools. I've looked at surveys and I really try to learn from others uh, to better understand how we should be approaching online teaching and how we should be thinking about this in particular uh, due to the pandemic. So definitely online teaching in an environment where you have normal interactions offline is going to be different than online teaching in an environment where people um, it's just a, uh, a uh, term like Zoom fatigue is something that everyone understand and understand that it exists regardless of the platform because it is difficult to, that all of your interactions are online. So we're definitely going to be thinking about that as well. So now, uh, before we get started, uh, and before I tell you a little bit more about, you know, um, my advice and my insight, I wanted to start by learning from you. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to actually uh, share a, a link to a poll uh, with everyone, and I'm going to also show you the results. Uh, this poll is going to be anonymous. You don't have to sign up to any system. You just have to go to the link that I'm going to share in the chat. Uh, so I'm going to share it now so uh, everyone should be able to have this link. Um, and then on my screen, I'm going to share the, the output of the, poll, of the poll that will be updated um, while you respond to it. Uh, so please go ahead, uh, click this link and start responding to, to the poll. And I'll give you a few seconds to do that. I know it takes time, uh, but let's see where, where people are at. So of course, the first question that you're all seeing is how you're feeling about online teaching. Uh, I'm curious to see you know, the pulse of the room and where people are at. Uh, I see a lot of you are feeling pretty good, but some of you are uh, a little bit no, more uh, in an angst uh, situation, uh, not yet really comfortable. Uh, hopefully by the end of our conversation or uh, my presentation, this will uh, become better, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm going to give you a few more seconds and, and we see where, where we're at. Uh, so 50% happy, I think that's pretty neat. Um, Thirty percent, a little bit shocked. Uh, hopefully, um, some of the tidbits uh, and information I will give you uh, is going to be helpful for that. Um, excellent. Uh, my next question for you is the following. Uh, so this is going to be kind of a, a word cloud uh, that is going to be created. So try to think of one or two words uh, when you think about online teaching. What are you most concerned about? Why are you kind of uh, worried about this? What, what is the things that you are, are concerned about or, or worried about? Is everyone seeing the question? No. Ah, is everyone seeing the question now? Excellent. 
Uh, so slowly see, we have all of these technical difficulties and we'll talk about this in, this in the webinar as well. But I see one of the major words that comes out is engagement. I see boredom, I see connectivity, and we'll definitely talk about all of these things. So I'm really excited that, that these are the things you're concerned about because we will be talking about this. But the number one thing is engagement and I, I have a lot of content around that. Uh, so I'm excited about uh, talking uh, to you about, about this issue. Uh, wonderful. Um, the next uh, question that I have, so some of you are, are, are seem happy, a lot of you seem happy. So the next question that I had is, uh, when you think about online teaching, what are you most excited about? So there are some positive things and uh, we're, we're gonna be talking about them. Uh, so I see uh, someone says flexibility, um, commute, yes. <laughs> um, probably I've seen uh, sneakers, uh, pajamas, uh, convenience, but you're most excited about the flexibility. And I'll try to share uh, some other things that we should all be excited about as well, other than just the, the flexibility and the ability to actually, you know, uh, teach in new ways and think and connect um, in different ways than we are able to do in a physical classroom. Uh, wonderful. Um, so for now, I'm going to um, uh, stop uh, sharing this poll and we're going to go back to, um, to our main presentation. All right, uh, so uh, given, that, given everything that I've learned, I've developed the, the, following, um, the following framework about remote teaching and learning that I'm um, excited to share with you. Uh, so uh, what is this framework about? Uh, so essentially, uh, we're going to think about a few different things and I'm going to talk about each and every one of these as we progress in this presentation. Um, the first, the R in remote uh, stands for reactions, or I'm going to explain exactly what this is. E is for eye contact, M is for manageable, O is for be organized, T is about being thoughtful, and E is around engagement and evaluation. And I'm really glad that these words came up in the word cloud when we were uh, asking about uh, issues that you are worried about. Um, I see there are a few questions about sharing of the slides. So all of the seminar um, uh, video will be shared later. So you will be able to have access to these slides later uh, for sure. Um, so um, let's get started. Uh, so what are we think what am I thinking about when I'm talking about reactions? Uh, so we know that uh, one of the first uh, concerns that many of us have is how do we read the room in a situation of um, when we don't actually, um, we're not able to see people in the same uh, way that we do in the classroom. Uh, even if you're able to see my face and, you know, I have my camera on, you only see this square. Uh, if I don't raise my hand, you don't know what I'm doing with my hand. Uh, you definitely don't see my body and reading the room is, is, uh, is very difficult in this situation. Um, at HBS, we have a, a great policy where students are supposed to have their video cameras on. Uh, so we are very lucky in that sense, because uh, once you do that, you can do a lot and you can encourage students uh, to try to improve their nonverbal communication as much as possible. Uh, so one thing that I try to train all the students to do is, you know, can you see my slides? Uh, thumbs up and thumbs down. If I see enough thumbs up, uh, on the squares in the screen in front of me. I know that things are going smoothly. If I see uh, thumbs down or someone kind of waving their hands like this, I know that there is some kind of problem. Uh, the same with audio, etc. Uh, in a similar way, I encourage students uh, when they listen to what is happening in class to, you know, show me with facial expression or gestures if they agree or disagree with what, with what is being said. Uh, you know, nod <laughs> if you definitely agree with what is said. Uh, you can show me that you disagree. And this is really helpful in picking who to call on next. So basically trying to figure out ways, you know how in the classroom you have students that their hand is raised all the way up and they're kind of jumping from the chair, uh, trying to figure out ways how to do that online. And I um, encourage the students to do that because I think it definitely makes for a better discussion if people are involved and excited and actually have something to say than if I randomly try to choose someone um, that is not reacting to what is going on in the conversation. So I would say something like, 
Oh, Alex, I see you're so eager uh, to make a contribution. Uh, what, what are you thinking about this uh, in a way that helps kind of involve them in the conversation? The difficulty, of course, becomes um, in the situation where students cannot have their video on or the policy and the norm around the video is not as good as it is here. And I understand that, you know, some people just um, have the challenge of not having the video on because of connectivity issues and things like that. And we have to be aware of this as well. What do we do then? We try to use other tools that Zoom or any other platform that we use for teaching um, allows us to use. Uh, for example, the chat functions, uh, polls, uh, things like um, the little emojis that a lot of these um, software offer us um, and really try to, uh, to gauge reactions that way. Um, I know it's not as good as video, uh, but we can use those um, in a similar manner, um, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down uh, with the emojis um, to, to help us guide this as well. Um, the next item that I want to talk about is around eye contact. So in a physical classroom, you know, it's okay where most of the time you're not exactly making eye contact with everyone, although you can definitely make eye contact. In this new environment, it's very difficult to make eye contact. Uh, what happens a lot, and I'm sure that by now we've all been in tons of seminars and tons of presentations that are online. Uh, people sometimes have multiple screens, uh, their slides are somewhere here, and what they're doing is presenting to us, uh, but looking at this screen. Uh, once I start doing this, this is very, very disengaging for you. Online, it's so easy for people to multitask, to be distracted, to look at other things. And if you don't try to make the effort to make eye contact with them, then it's going to be that much harder for them to listen to what you have to say. So what I always try to do is put uh, what I'm talking at right in front of me. So the slides are as close as possible to the camera when I'm talking about slides that I wanna see or I have a video of uh, the student that is speaking right in front of me where the camera is. So again, I'm making eye contact. Uh, I've heard some people like to put uh, pictures of loved ones or their puppy or something like this next to the camera to remind them to look at it. But I think it's uh, extremely important to try as much as you can to make eye contact, uh, to actually show people that you're kind of uh, looking at them and trying to engage with them uh, as well. Uh, so um, uh, someone is asking, where is the camera placed? It's placed right above my computer. I'm actually using just one large monitor and the camera is placed right in front of me uh, and the slides are placed right in front of me. So it seems to you like I'm looking at you and talking to you, which makes it more engaging and you can you, you actually feel like I'm talking to you. And I think this is something that is relatively easy to practice. You just need one friend <laughs> that is willing to practice with you to log into the conversation and make sure that you're uh, making eye contact and looking at something that you're, you're looking at. Uh, so definitely do that. Um, the next thing that I want to talk about is uh, manageable. And I mean this in many, many different ways. Um, and the first thing is, is just this, you know, uh, first thing when we think about online setting, we think about, oh, I must need five different monitors, three different cameras, fancy microphones, extreme special lighting, other gadgets, iPad, Wacom, uh, many other tablets. Uh, what do I do for boards? Oh, maybe I also need a flip chart behind me, a whiteboard, a blackboard, all of these things. Uh, so yes, uh, it's easy for us to manage technology. We also like to be in control. And since the pandemic started, we all lost control. Uh, and this is something that feels like it's easy for us to control. However, um, I feel like many times this is make, makes everything more complex and it's much easier uh, when you can do things that are manageable and simple uh, for you. So I would say um, my advice about all of this is just to keep it simple. And I know simple means different things for different people. So for one person, simple might mean having uh, different monitors and fancy gadgets. For other people, it just means uh, I'm just going to use one monitor, one camera, a piece of paper, and essentially raise the paper and show it to the camera uh, when I want to do that. And that is fine too. You should do whatever you feel comfortable with and what you're confident with. What I do, I just have one large monitor with the one camera. Um, and that works for me. Um, other people have other preferences, but I found that eye contact is important and it's much easier to do when you actually just use the one monitor. 
Um, the next most important thing is, okay, I, I'm saying this, this is my opinion, but what do students care about? And through tons and tons of surveys that we ran, we learned that, you know, it doesn't matter if you sit down or stand up, if you use fancy devices or not too fancy devices, if you are going to write on a flip chart or in a PowerPoint or on something more sophisticated, what matters is that you are present, that you are engaged, the content is good, that learning actually happens, and the students are agnostic to all of these methods. So if something seems too much for you, don't do it. Do something that you're comfortable with, that you can credibly deliver the good value that you are used to delivering, because that's what's important for students. And students get that. Uh, they've seen all the fancy PowerPoints. They don't care about that. They care about learning. They care about you. They care about you being present and you talking to them. And that's exactly what you should be doing in a way that is manageable for you and simple for you. <clears throat> and I'm going to say this three times because I think this is really important here. Uh, and it relates to everything I said so far. Practice. Practice, 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 because you're not going to feel confident and comfortable if you don't practice. Uh, technology always has failures. Things are going to break down, connectivity break down. Nothing is smooth as you want it to be. Um, so practice so that you feel more comfortable, that everything feels fluent to you and you understand how to use uh, the equipment that you have uh, in order to deliver that value that we know that you can deliver and you know that you can deliver. Um, finally, once you're comfortable with what you're doing, try to experiment, see what works. Maybe, you know, change it up a little bit, mix it up, uh, but always stay within your comfort level because all we want is to deliver a good experience for students uh, in a comfortable, credible, authentic, manageable way. And we can't do it if we're not going to be comfortable. So definitely um, focus on that. Uh, the next item is O for organized. Uh, so, um, I'm going to talk about many different things within organization. The number one thing that I'm sure some of you have already noticed or heard from colleagues is that things are going to take longer online. People tend to be uh, more long-winded, muting, unmuting, connectivity issues, technology issue. You're going to, you should expect to cover about 70 to 80% of the material that you would normally cover in a physical classroom. Um, so, so that's the number one thing. And this is going to affect a lot of different aspects of your teaching. It's going to affect, for example, how you look at your teaching plan for the day. Um, you're going to have to try to, to decide uh, what is the most important thing? What do I need to make sure that I actually cover and focus on that? What is okay to let go? If there are things that you feel that are not okay to let go, but are very difficult to deliver in this way, uh, maybe you can find a different solution. Maybe you can assign a reading. Maybe you can create a video, uh, what we call asynchronous content, um, meaning that it's not a live session, but something that you record and students can watch before or after the class. Uh, maybe there is a small discussion session that covers that material. Uh, but essentially, you need to think about uh, which of the material is important and which of the material can I pu push to some other time and how do I do that? And maybe it's not that important. That's okay too. Um, the second thing I would say is make sure that you have everything you need next to you. So this is kind of one of the advantages of online. Um, like I said before, you only see this square. I might have tons of information around me with the specific agenda for the class, uh, any material that I want to use, uh, maybe this, the list of students that I want to call on. All of these things can kind of be in front of me. I can have my cheat sheets uh, in front of me while I teach and make sure you have everything because again, you have a relatively short amount of time and you wanna make sure that you're engaged. You wanna make sure you make this eye contact that I was talking about and having everything next to you is super helpful. Um, that extends also to the environment that you're using. If you're going to, if you, you're teaching from home or from your office, make sure that it's, uh, set up in the way that you need it. Um, I, I have to drink when I talk, uh, water is always here. Uh, it's important for me, I'm, I'm used to from the physical classroom to have a clock right in front of me uh, so that I can manage time. Make sure you have a clock. Make sure you have uh, lighting that doesn't cover your uh, face and you're sitting in the dark like some evil genius or something like that. 
Um, I would also say that you should try to find a backup option. So I'm not saying you need a whole huge setup and computer and, and all of that, uh, but uh, you, know, you can use your uh, phone or other device uh, make sure that it has uh, batteries, make sure that it's charged. Uh, phone usually has a network ex instead of your Wi-Fi network. It, all of the apps that you, we use for teaching, if it's Zoom, uh, Microsoft Team, or other apps, they all have a phone application. Try to have the, that ready for that. If you're going to use a tablet for teaching or something that requires battery, make sure it's charged. Uh, so kind of make sure that all of these things are, are ready for you. Um, the other things, of course, everything that you are going to use should be kind of queued and ready to go. Uh, I wanted to use my slides. I need to make sure my slides are ready. If I'm using polls, I know I want to make sure the polls are ready and everything is ready once I want to use it because there is not a lot of time. So we want to make sure that everything is organized. And because we don't want to be flustered, we want to feel comfortable. So if everything is organized for us, this is going to work much, much better. Um, related, computer hygiene turns out to be very, very important. So from my experience, most of the Zoom, Teams, Google Meet problems are solved by restarting your computer. Uh, so I have my small uh, pre-class ritual of restarting my computer, uh, closing all of the applications that I don't need, and only having what I need for the class in front of me, because that's what's going to work well for me, and that's what's going to ensure that I'm organized and I'm ready for class. Uh, so, so definitely I recommend to do that. Um, the next thing that I'm going to talk about is T for thoughtful. I'm going to, to talk about uh, a few different things around that. Uh, number one is um, you might have noticed uh, that we tend to narrate more online and I'm going to explain why this is important. So again, we only see this one square of everyone. Um, and if we don't narrate our action, um, that our viewers or our students or our audience might feel pretty disoriented. When you share something, the view in the screen is changing. If I'm not going to tell you, oh, I'm going to share a new slide, this might be a little bit disorienting for you. Uh, if I'm trying to get something working and it doesn't work, and I just sit in silence while I'm uh, trying to make it work, students are not sure, is my computer not working? Is my sound not working? Is, the, is it my problem? Are other people having this problem? So tell them what you're doing. Tell them, oh, my mouse is giving me trouble now, or I'm, I'm going to share this video now, but it's not loading. Uh, share what is going on so that they understand what is going on. In a physical classroom, they see that you're struggling with the equipment. In this situation, it's, it might be harder to see and it might be harder for them to disentangle uh, whether it's their own problem or it's something in your setup. Uh, so narrating what, what is going on is helpful. The second thing they want to say is because of the time, uh, because of the way that we use things, I'm going to talk about this uh, in a little bit even more, is you have to be more deliberate and purposeful in everything that you say. So you need to be a little bit more organized to ask a little bit more clear questions uh, because it's harder to get engaged. It's harder not to be distracted. Uh, and we really want to make sure that everyone understands what is going on and doing it in the best way possible in order to actually learn from this experience as well. Uh, number three is adapt your syllabus and requirements. Um, let's say you have group projects. Group projects could work really well in the online environment, uh, but they also might not work well. Maybe it requires a meeting of students and students are now in five different time zones and it's impossible for them to meet. Maybe you need to consider different group sizes. Uh, maybe you need to consider uh, smaller group size, uh, smaller group sizes. Uh, maybe you need to consider switching the project, making the project more online. Uh, maybe students don't have opportunity to uh, assign, to meet friends to be on teams with. Maybe you need to assign these teams. So try to be a little bit more thoughtful about all of the constraints that we are facing um, due to kind of your requirements. A similar question around quizzes or exams that now have to be taken online. What can you take online and what can you not take online? How do you deal uh, with um, the possibility of cheating or looking up things? Uh, how do you make your uh, material such that uh, it wouldn't matter as much or that you can trust your students? You really have to think about that as well. 
Uh, the final thing I would say, you know, we're, we are in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, there are a lot of anxiety. Um, not everyone has internet all the time. Some people have to deal with um, children, uh, job loss, other issues. And so be compassionate to your students. Uh, maybe they're not connecting and not on point and not on top of things because they have all of these other issues. Uh, so definitely have that in mind as well as you organize and think about your classes. Um, the final uh, or uh, the last E that I'm going to talk about, although it's going to be a pretty lengthy conversation, is all about engagement and different tools, tips and tricks on how to garner and, and get more engagement. And the number one I think I would say is to mix it up, but not too much. So you don't need uh, fancy prior techniques every single class. You don't need that every minute something new and exciting happens, but you need to make sure that it doesn't feel monotone, that once in a while you're doing something different, you're switching it up. You have, you know, um, one day you're, you're using one board, one day you're using another board. Um, one day you're showing uh, a poll, another day you're using the chat in a creative way. Just do different things so that engagement is easier and you're making it uh, more interesting for students to join. I'm going to give you a lot of examples and ideas, and hopefully some of these will be useful for you. Like I said before, pick the ones that are manageable for you. Some of these are quite fancy, so you don't have to start with them. You can start with the simple stuff. Uh, so the number one, um, uh, the first thing I'm going to say is participation-based is so much easier to be engaged with than non-participation based. What do I mean by participation based? At HBS, we're very lucky because the way we teach, most of our uh, classes are case-based. Case-based classes require student discussion. Students know that they have to participate in class. Having uh, an online discussion versus an online lecture is more engaging, just, it just is. Uh, so, and I know not all material can be taught in a, in a case or discussion way. And uh, maybe you wanna uh, split your class. Maybe there is uh, a part of the class that you speak and then a part that is around discussion or around Q&A. Maybe some of the material can be taught uh, in an asynchronous manner, um, either by reading or by watching a video of you or someone else explaining the material. And the class is more focused on questions, answering them, discussing the materials. Maybe it's around a student presentation. Um, it doesn't have to be the entire class, but something that is more participation-based uh, really helps students around engagement and really helps students connect with each other and feel connected in this world that is now less and less connected because we're all in some form of quarantine or lockdown, um, at least until the pandemic is over. Um, the third thing is polls. So I gave you an example of polls, uh, but I'm going to now share a lot of different things around poll design. Um, so um, what I um, have on this slide are different goals of, uh, of polls and different considerations. So, you know, one thing that you can do with polls is just like what I tried to do earlier is to get kind of a pulse of the class. Where is the class at? Where is my audience at? Are you feeling happy and excited about online teaching? Are you terrified of online teaching? And you can do this uh, for uh, literally anything that you want. And it's very, if you just think about this, almost for every single class, you can find a way to involve a poll or a point in class where a poll might be appropriate. Uh, you can use poll also to verify understanding. Uh, so I have colleagues that use polls uh, once they're done teaching a material or in the beginning of the next class, they ask a true false questions or a multiple choice questions. And then they see how many of the students uh, are with them and understand what we're talking about and are you know, on top of the material and how many students are not. Um, this allows them to figure out where are the gaps in understanding and how can we uh, fill those gaps. And you might even be able to utilize the students that answered correctly uh, to help with this question. It also shows those students that you know, answer co everything correctly, that not everyone is on the same page, that there are gaps in understanding and that uh, we should all try to figure out how to learn this better together. Uh, go, um, polls also help facilitate debate. Um, and what do I mean by that? So, you know, many cases uh, that we teach or many subjects have uh, multiple different options. 
um, if you have a poll that you create uh, that shows these options, you can show how many of the class um, think one way or another, and then it helps you kind of uh, set the stage up to, you know, there are different opinions even within the class, and we can discuss that. I also really like using polls as a warm calling tool. What do I mean by that? So one of the challenges in, in online uh, teaching is ensuring this um, equity, per, uh, participation equity, and ensuring that students that are uh, more quiet uh, and usually tend to talk less or uh, more introvert also speak. Uh, if I use polls, many, many of the polling um, systems, so the one I used earlier is anonymous, but many of them allow you to see which students said what. So you can uh, use a poll and then pull exactly the students that are on your list to call on and make sure that they speak. Let's say Alex is on your list. Um, Alex said A uh, in the poll. Then once you see the result, you know, Alex, why did you say A? Um, what is the reason for that? And then you can bring another student that said B uh, and either have them uh, debate each other or just bring them into the conversation. Um, finally, Polls also allows you to get feedback from students. What I did when I taught during the spring, because I was trying so many different things, every time after I experimented with something, I used polls for feedback. The fact that they are anonymous was extremely helpful because students felt comfortable to say what they liked and what they didn't like with no ramifications. Uh, so one thing that you should be thinking about when you're designing these polls is whether you need them to be anonymous or not anonymous whether you want to share the results or not share the results. Um, so the other things are um, the timing of the poll. A lot of the polls I spoke about are going to be during class. Uh, many of them are pre-planned. So, you know, the poll is already set up in the way that I set it. However, um, many of the software, Zoom, Microsoft Teams and other, allows you to kind of do on the fly uh, polling. What do I mean by that? Um, you know, you can even use something as simple as raise your hand if you think A or if you think B. Um, raise your hand if you agree with the previous comment um, and then pull people into the conversation as well. Um, you can do that uh, with just the hand raise that all of these software has. Uh, Zoom has this yes, no buttons that you can use in a similar way, and it really allows you to uh, react to what is going on, offer something more interactive, also kind of see who is listening uh, and how they're reacting, uh, and you can use it in the case of no cameras, like, like I said before. Um, you can also use polls before class, um, so you ask students to submit an answer to a simple question uh, before class uh, is before class even starts, let's say by 8 a.m. Um, and your class is at 10 so that you have time to compile that and see where students are at before class. And you might want to ask them again the question after some discussion or something like that. Um, during class, um, you either have to prepare a, a specific poll for each class, but there are also polls that are appropriate for multiple classes. Uh, for example, one of the pre-polls that I have just set up in my Zoom always is what grade do you give the protagonist uh, between A and F? And it's always relevant, you can always use it, and it always creates a very interesting discussion. Uh, so that's um, kind of a little bit about polls. Um, the next thing I'm going to talk about is about chat usage. Uh, so we all have seen chat. Uh, this time the chat is not on because there are so many participants, uh, but in normal classes, usually uh, it's okay, uh, to, it's okay manageable, and I'll mean, I'll say what I mean by that in a second. Uh, so why is chat wonderful? What does it allow us to do that we can't do in the physical classroom? It allows us to kind of peek into people's thought bubbles. We can understand, we can know what they're thinking about without them having to actually speak. The challenge with chat is that it's pretty difficult to monitor. So if I want to talk to you, if I want to be uh, teaching something or learning something or listening to students, and I also am trying to read what is going on in the chat, it might be very difficult. So uh, this is where I go back to being deliberate and purposeful and um, monitoring the chat and doing it in very directive times. Um, and I'll, I'll give you uh, examples for that as well. So you might, um, you know, uh, I have a colleague that before every class, uh, before the class actually starts, you know, in the few minutes where people gather, she shares a slide that says, while we gather, the question of the day is X. 
and she asks some question that will be relevant later in the class. Uh, but people type in uh, during the time that they're waiting uh, the answers to these questions, and then she has time to monitor that and look at that um, and, and then go back to those students and say, oh, you know, uh, Chris, uh, you said that this is a, a, a good idea. Uh, tell us more about this. Or Alex, you referred to this. Um, tell us more. So, so that's one way to do it. Uh, it's also pretty good for brainstorming or reflection or giving ideas um, of things that are different or similar to what we're talking about. Again, the way that I like to do it so it's more manageable is kind of turn it off and turn it on when, when I want. Uh, so the chat is usually off unless, unless they need to tell me about technical issues that they're having or something like that. And I turn it on when I want their answers to questions. Uh, so let's say we're talking about uh, pricing. Um, so I can ask all the students to say, what is the price that you recommend? They can type it into the chat. I have the whole range of prices. And again, I can use it for warm calling and picking a few students. Uh, the one with the lowest price, let's say $5, uh, the one with the highest price, $1,000, and to get them to explain where they were coming from uh, and how they do this. Um, you can also gauge students' reactions from this. Um, you can have a policy by which if they strongly agree or strongly disagree, they type something into the chat and then you know to call on them next. Uh, you can use it for Q&A. Uh, for example, when you have a guest speaker or just if they have questions during and um, you don't like them uh, interrupting you, maybe you're okay with them writing questions into the chat. An important thing is to have very clear rules and expectations about how chat is going to be used because you don't want the chat to be this uh, place of, you know, free-flowing conversations, parallel world conversation. You want everyone to be in the class, but use the chat in an opportunistic way to actually help you um, to, to, uh, to get something out of the class. Uh, some of my colleagues also like using chat for reflections um, in that they leave the last five minutes uh, kind of asking students, what, what did you learn from the class today? What, what are your reflections? And that's useful for them to see what students learned. Um, it, some of them also use this for grading. Of course, if you're going to use this for grading, you have to be very clear about that. Um, so, um, so that's uh, my uh, comments about chat at this point. Uh, the next item I'm going to talk about is breakout rooms or small group work. Uh, so if you've been on Zoom, you definitely uh, have used <laughs> breakout rooms or the word breakout rooms, but essentially what it does, it allows you to separate uh, um, the class into smaller groups and then regroup as a class. Uh, the challenge with breakout rooms is, you know, once you get into a new uh, room with, with few people uh, that are your peers, you're so excited. You want to see what is going on with them, how they're doing, um, is anything new? Let's Let's gossip about what just happened in class. Uh, so in order to make sure that this is uh, effective, you need to have a very clear uh, deliverable um, and you need to make it very clear uh, what, what they're expected to do during the time they're in this breakout rooms. Um, I will say that breakout rooms are extremely engaging for students because it allows them to be in a small group and talk to each other. Um, they come up with ideas. They come back to the class super energized. So I encourage you to do it, but I encourage you to do it in a very specific way. So I'm going to show you now an example uh, that I use in one of my cases. Uh, so in this uh, case about day two, what I do is essentially create a slide like this. Um, equivalent to the number of rooms that I'm going to create in a breakout room. And I tell students, you know, if you're room one, you're going to type in, uh, in slide one. If you're room two, slide two, etc. I always uh, make it clear what the assignment is before they go to the room. In this case, they have to basically come up with a marketing plan for this company. They have to decide what is the target market and how do they get there. Uh, I also like to leave a spot for their names. Uh, the reason I do this is for the following advantages. Uh, first, there is a very, very clear deliverable. They go to the room, even if they forgot what we were just talking about, they see this and they know what they're supposed to do. Second, it allows me to monitor what is going on in the room. I can see, you know, room five started typing in, room one is still kind of thinking about it. Um, I can see maybe they all finished early so I can bring them back earlier. Maybe they all need more time because they're still answering the first part. So it helps me gauge that. It also helps me to facilitate warm calling. So I can decide, you know, um, 
this, there's a person, Alex is on my list to call. I can pick the room where Alex is at and ask Alex to present what the group did. Um, and, and that usually gets them to speak, even if they're not the most talkative students, because they were in a room and decided about this together and they feel more confident because of the discussion with their peers. Um, it also is really helpful in debriefing, uh, in debriefing right after the, the breakout room. So while they're in the room, I can see what each of the rooms did. And then, you know, for example, room 10 um, have a, has a very basic solution. So I want to start with that. But room one has a sophisticated solution. So after that, I want to go to room one. It also helps with grading because you have something deliverable. Um, you can decide if you want to be the same group so they get to know each other or you want to mix it up every class and all of the different softwares allow you to do that. Uh, a few other ideas. Uh, so this one is definitely for the most advanced uh, is to use student annotations. Uh, so what I do in this case, so basically it allows students to write on your slides. Uh, so for example, in this Hubble case, uh, the, the company has um, four different options uh, that are basically to decide between uh, different uh, products and different geographies. I put this two by two, I enable student annotation. Of course, this requires trusting your students uh, that they will do this uh, in, a, in a good way. Uh, but then I just allow them to say, you know, where, where should the company go? Uh, and this is an example of, of some of their answers. So they can either uh, draw in it, they can put a stamp like the stars, the heart and the check marks, or they can actually type in something uh, which gives me more information. Here I know that most, most of the students in the class uh, thought that they should either focus on new geographies or new products, but not both. Uh, I can use this again to warm call to understand, but also it gives the class a nice visual of what their peers are thinking and what they are doing. Uh, so that's another uh, way to do that. Um, let me talk about a few other suggestions. Uh, so, you know, video or audio clips just to mix things up. Uh, with video and audio clips, if you notice that a lot of students have technical difficulties or your internet is not very stable, don't do it during class. Uh, post it after class or before class and not during the class, uh, but maybe the vi video is still valuable as a teaching material. Uh, guests. One of the benefits of this online environment is it's much easier to invite guests because they don't have to travel. Uh, maybe you can get, uh, you don't need them every class, but once in a while there's someone else that they're seeing and someone else they're exposed to, uh, and that is a nice way to also change things up. Um, you might want to spend some of the time with your screen shared and some of the time with your screen not shared so that you see all the tiles of students assuming that you can see the tiles. So just mixing up things, I think uh, it helps with engagement uh, of students and um, facilitation of a better discussion. Um, finally, there are also, you know, students presentations or students sharing their own screens and showing something, for example, an Excel calculation or a slide they prepared. Uh, usually when I do that, I, I give them a warning in advance because, you know, they need to make sure that they have everything set up in the, in the way way that they want it to be presented as well. Uh, they want th to put their uh, best foot forward as well. They want their Excel spreadsheet to be uh, good and to be able to explain it. So I definitely do that um, and it helps. Uh, and students are usually happy with that. Um, there are also ways to think about uh, engagement outside of class um, in terms of how to think about creating more of a community. Um, it could be like a Slack channel, a canvas uh, or a blackboard uh, way to write reflections or talk about the material that was discussed in class, uh, but essentially create kind of a community uh, of learners uh, that are interested in the topic. Uh, you can, again, this is something that if you want to facilitate, maybe you grade this. Maybe if people made very good contributions there, then you um, give them a bonus grade or something like that. That helps you create a better community because students are incentivized to, to add things there. Another thing we've noticed is that because um, we don't have the physical classroom and you know the short uh, conversations before class or kind of the pit dive after class, students are craving talking to faculty and talking to other students. Uh, maybe you can offer small group meetings um, to, to have conversations um, 
do it in an efficient way, uh, maybe do it around a particular topic, but allow students to have conversations uh, with you and with other students after class as well. Um, and asynchronous content uh, we talked about too. Uh, so all of these are kind of different ideas and, way, and ways to facilitate engagement and create engagement uh, in this new uh, normal. Um, the last item that I have on the agenda is evaluation. Uh, and that relates back to everything we talked about. Uh, you have to be very clear. What is the grading structure? What am I going to grade? At HBS, we typically have uh, between 40 and 50% of the grade is about class participation. Uh, what does participation mean online? You have to be very clear about that. Which of the components that we just mentioned are going to be graded? Am I going to be graded about a chat conversation? Am I going to be graded about the polls? Am I going to be graded about the contribution to the Slack channel? All of these different options, you have to be just very, very clear uh, and set clear expectations so there are not misconceptions. A lot of students um, sometimes misunderstand the difference between attendance and participation, and it's very important to explain to them what it means and what you care about and what you are going to evaluate. Uh, so definitely be clear about that. And again, I would say what I said before, uh, compassion. We are still in the midst of a global pandemic. If someone didn't submit something, uh, maybe they're anxious. Maybe uh, they have some kind of issue. Maybe their, their internet wasn't connected. They weren't able to uh, access the class. Maybe they are taking care of their child while they are attending class. Uh, so try to be aware of that. Try to uh, reach out to students that are struggling because there might be something more going on uh, than just uh, what we, we are typically thinking about in this teaching. Um, so um, let me wrap uh, this model. So today I talked to you about uh, remote teaching and learning, and I offered this uh, REMOTE uh, framework uh, talking about reactions, eye contact, making sure things are manageable, organized, uh, being thoughtful and thinking a lot about uh, engagement and evaluation uh, because that is going to be um, super important uh, in this world. This is the number one word you said you're worried about is how to think about engagement. Uh, before we wrap up, I was hoping we can uh, go back to the poll from before. I can share it again um, on the chat and I'll share it again uh, with us here. And uh, my next question to you is, uh, essentially going back to the question from the beginning. How are you feeling about online teaching? Um, and, you know, we hope as professors and instructors that what we say uh, is actually effective or, or changing your mind. Um, and you're, you're all excellent students. I don't know if uh, you're being kind to me uh, or actually you're more excited now after this conversation, but from 50%, we grew to about 70% of uh, feeling better around teaching. Uh, so I'm, I'm definitely excited about that. I'll give it a few more times uh, to, um, to see if there are changes, uh, but, uh, but, but that is uh, kind of where we are. Um, let's see if there are any other questions that are uh, here and I haven't responded on uh, yet. Um, so I see there are um, uh, questions around, um, around uh, uh, people from different um, nationalities and backgrounds. Um, and how do you get them to, to speak and how do you get them to be animated? And I think part of this is just telling them, you know, this is just what you have to do now. If I'm going to, um, uh, we are in a challenge situation where all I can see is a square of your face. And it's very important for me to still learn from you, to still be able to teach you, to still be able to communicate with you. And if you can, please try to use your hand to signal to me, to show me you know, with your facial expressions, with, with gestures, uh, what you're thinking. Uh, if, if students consistently have this problem, maybe you can use the, some of the chat ideas that I suggested, uh, such as, um, you know, um, saying I agree or I disagree in chat in a way that will be able to, to get to them. Because of course, we wanna be uh, fair. We wanna ensure equitable participation for all of our students and not only those that are more animated. Uh, so definitely uh, we have to be uh, uh, thoughtful about that as well. Uh, so with that, 
I want to thank you all for listening. Thank you for the awesome questions and comments. Thank you for participating in my polls. Uh, I hope that you took something away from this, um, some ideas or tips or ways that you are going to uh, improve uh, or change or uh, think about teaching. I also would love to learn more from you. Uh, you can, um, it's very easy to find me and, and uh, connect with me and, and uh, tell me how it's going for you. Uh, with that, I'll pass things back to Sandy. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, Ayelet. What a fabulous presentation. I'm not a professor and I even was getting excited if I could jump in the classroom and do some of these things, but uh, your energy is very inspiring. I also wanna thank everyone for joining us today. I hope you found today's presentation helpful. I wanna draw your attention to the links that are listed on this slide. First, if you don't have an educator account on the HBP Education website, I do encourage you to register. It is free. Uh, doing that will give you access to teaching notes, course planning tools, free trials of simulations, and of course it gives you access to the entire catalog of HBS cases and simulations. The second link listed is a link to a resources page that we created. We've curated resources that are helpful in teaching online and in hybrid classes. And I also want to draw your attention to the third link in chat. So the third link is to a new article just published this morning for our inspiring minds, authored by Ayelet. In the article, she's gonna discuss more about why ensuring active and equitable student participation is challenging, especially online. And she shares helpful methods that she and her HBS colleagues have developed to encourage and fairly assess student contributions in virtual classrooms. These links are posted in chat now, and they can also be found on the HBP Higher Education website. I will keep chat open for a few minutes to give you time to explore the links. So thank you again for spending your time with us today. Please do connect with us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. We're always interested, we're here, and we wanna know what you're thinking and what you're experiencing with your students in, in your classrooms. Thank you again and be well. Uh, thank you, everyone.